I am very excited to introduce our two speakers for today, Robin and Jamie with Superclusters. I'm going to turn it over to you all. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Sam. I'm just yeah. going to get hooked up here to our little screen share. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. All We're really right. excited uh, to chat with everyone. Um, real quick, go if you want to engage with the uh, astronaut database right now, uh, while we present it, it's uh, superclustercom slash astronauts. And those uh, who have uh, want to use it on their mobile device uh, can download the Supercluster app real quick. Yeah, so we're going to be introducing this, this tool, and we would be happy if by the end of it, you were distracted by using it instead yeah. of listening to us talk about it. So, so okay that's, our, that. that's our secret <laughs> plan. Um, so and I just put the link in the chat for those who are on their computers. Oh, thank you okay. so much. Yeah. Oh, here's the thing. Now I'm screen sharing this. I got to make sure I can switch to the next. Sorry, guys. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I was ahead. <laughs> That's why. Anyway, what is Supercluster? We wanted to introduce you to who we are very quickly. Um, I mean, our, our big picture mission is to make it uh, easier, more fun, and more exciting to be a space fan. But in the early days, we made sort of an, an anthemic video that shows exactly um, what that is about. Um, so I'm just going to play that for you guys, if we can get this share. Oh, sorry. Hold on. We're going to switch over to this window, share that window, make it big, and here we go. And does this video have sound? Oh, yeah. Is the sound up, Jamie? I I was going it. To... Oh, it is. Oh, dear. The sound is not coming through. That's unfortunate. Yes. So I think if you, when you share your screen, there's a little option to share sound as well to, that you have to click. Okay. Let's, um, let's try and use computers. Yeah, no worries. If it's I in that bottom. Here. Ooh, share sound. You yeah. are 100% correct. The only yeah. time we don't know how to use computers is when we're live somewhere. Yeah, by the, by the <laughs> way, I, I, I am a programmer, amongst other things, so this is, this is particularly uh, good that I don't know how to do these simple things. Okay, here we go. Um, we share this one. Are we now? Yeah, we're seeing it. Okay, great. And a video editor, but I can't play a video. Here we go. Space. It used to feel like this. Five, eight, seven, six, five. Now, it feels like this. This is our greatest story that too many are never told. That's why we're building Supercluster, to tell the human side of our greatest space stories with films, podcasts, articles, events, the works. Supercluster is your best place to stay up to speed on space and understand space like never before. For example, here's a black hole explained in 15 seconds. Everything in the universe with mass has gravity, even this apple. Cram lots of apples together, you get lots of gravity. And if all that stuff is in a tiny space, eventually you get maximum gravity. Nothing can escape maximum gravity, not even light. That's a black hole. And this is Supercluster. Hey. Hi. Hello. These people collaborate at lots of different places. Grand Army, A24, Dropbox. These people love space. Because space inspires wonder, awe, adventure. It challenges us in mind, body, and spirit to break boundaries and mend them. Between countries and the peoples in the interest of peace and progress of all humanity. To take a real look at ourselves and toward the unknown. Four, three, two, one. Because space is amazing. Space is for everyone. Space inspires humanity's greatest story. This is Supercluster. Welcome to your greatest story. So that gives you an idea of what we are into. 
And let me just get us back over to. Yeah, we pu- we produced that video uh, a couple of years ago uh, when we were getting started up. I felt we needed a, a message uh, to introduce ourselves. And um, over the past two years, I think some of the projects that we've done really speak to just creating more space vans and getting people excited about space. And I think that leads us into uh, the astronaut database, which is a culmination of that mission and something that really speaks to what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. And as I had mentioned before, that that big mission to make it easier, more fun and more exciting to be a space fan is at the core of everything we do. Uh, But in this case, to accomplish that mission, we need to give people the right tools. So it's not just about telling them the story, but giving them interactive ways to learn more about that story, to explore it and to become the type of fan uh, that we all want to be. So this began, like our first big uh, endeavor into this was the launch tracker. Um, This is something that is active right now, has been for a while, run by our colleague Chris Gebhardt. And this tells you every single time something uh, of significance is launching from Earth into space. It gives you a countdown clock, it gives you the live stream, uh, if that's available, tells you the location and how to go see it uh, for when that is available again. Um, So this was our first foray into just that make it easier part. Um, And this has been really successful. We've worked with the community to build this into something that a lot of people rely on. But the launch tracker is for spaceships. So as you know, once that was out there, we thought, what about space travelers? This again, um, the human story being very important, we wanted to quickly shift from just these big big launch uh, vehicles to the people who are sometimes on top of them. So this, is what we're announcing because I've already mentioned it, but the the astronaut database, which has been live now for um, Robin, I guess it's been uh, almost six months, maybe. How? Yeah, we're we're nearing. Uh, we we had a beta phase uh, for a couple months, and then we rolled it out. So yeah, we're we're nearing that six month sort of uh, operation of the astronaut database. A few months of that has been completely public, and now it's just out there for everyone to use. And the astronaut database is really the next step in creating a whole utility where anyone can, one, know what's launching, who's launching it, or what's launching it, and um, just getting an idea of what orbit is like and what's going on beyond orbit in one place. Not having to go to read four to five articles or go to two or three Wikipedia pages to get the information. Uh, You should be able to get it in one place um, in a fun way, because space is fun. It shouldn't be a, you know, a, a tedious research project. And that's a really important concept to us of, of continuing to advance towards that goal of sort of creating for the fan a mission control for all of human spaceflight, all of the endeavors you know, outside of the atmosphere. If you were just going to be a fan and you wanted to sit there with all your monitors and be as close to that story as possible, we want to eventually be the entire suite of stories and utilities that make that possible. So the astronaut database specifically is the first complete, easy to navigate library of every human being being, animal, and robot that has ever flown to space with the little asterisk that plants are on their way. They're simply a little bit hard to categorize and track, uh, but that is the only uh, space traveler that lives uh, that is yet to be included in our database. And you'll see that, uh, you know, with the robots and mannequins, there are also some that are in the gray area between living and non-living. Um, and the, uh, something I want to emphasize here is easy to navigate. We didn't just want to present the data. We wanted to make it comparable, navigable. You wanted to make sure that you could move through it in ways that uh, revealed stories to you. So we wanted to um, talk a little bit about the research that went into this, um, because that was the beginning of the whole project, really, is we had to start somewhere and starting with just gathering all the data, um, which is something I'm sure you're all very familiar with, much more familiar than, than we are, um, and then see once it was in front of us, uh, how we could tell stories with it. Um, that meant that for a while, um, my life, and then I eventually pulled lots of other teammates into it, uh, looked like this, big giant spreadsheets. Um, this isn't going to be easy to read through the stream, but you're not meant to read it just to be blinded by it the way that um, you're probably used to and that we were. Um, but as we, you know, right away, as we started to collect this, it was clear that the project needed to be done. That's what the data was telling us is that this is disparate. It's all over the place. It's difficult to find. I didn't even have a good idea of exactly how many astronauts there were until months into this. I couldn't get a firm number 
um, just on that. And it's not even, it's not like it's a big complicated number. It's, you know, it's less than 600. Um, but it was difficult even to nail that down and the, all the different definitions um, that went into that. So uh, I thought Robin and I could share with you some of the specifics of those data problems, because some of them are kind of fun. So we have our little data problems list here. The first one I kind of pointed to already, but just incomplete info. There was no single place that was tracking all the astronauts, not even there was Wikipedia. No, right, and there was no centralized place at NASA to get right. all this information. Remember, not all astronauts are NASA astronauts. That is uh, something that you know hit us like a brick, because we're like, well, we have to look at all these different databases, but then we realized there wasn't different databases. Um, you know, the original thought behind the ADB was, well, this should exist. And I mm -hmm. think we wrote in the article about um, the astronaut database, we quickly realized why it doesn't. And that's because you have to really dig into the research. You have to, you know, dig under rocks and uh, check, you know, really obscure websites that were, uploaded in 1997, but never updated. And yeah. a lot of the information, not a lot, but some of the information was straight up incorrect. Like mm -hmm. the data was off. It was less or more, or the names were wrong, uh, you know, and there's, there's all these inconsistencies across the board. And that really was the heavy lift in, in doing the research. Uh, at the baseline, Supercluster is all spreadsheets. And that's where we have we do all the data. Lot of spreadsheets. You know, yeah. uh, it's, it's a, a lot of data. Yeah, Dropbox folders, spreadsheets, and mm -hmm. Slack is kind of the lifeblood, particularly in, in the current condition. Right. But yeah, Robin is absolutely right. That just all these, these disparate and incomplete places to find it, which was very strange, even in places like Wikipedia, where you'd think they would have a full list. Or we even just a few weeks ago found an error in a NASA press release, just because right. someone, you know, who knows, it's just one document, had compiled those numbers wrong. But for a few hours, that meant we had to dive in all over and try and figure out what the real story was and add up that number. It was something about total EVA time. Right. Um, the other thing, which is a big problem, is mismatched precision. Like, okay, well, this EVA tells me time down to the second, but then the other ones only tell me down to the minute. So we've, we're having to pick significant digits all over the place because when we're presenting this data in a unified interface, mm -hmm. we have to have it, we have to make certain assumptions about the format of that data. And so we were constantly just making decisions on this. Um, for a while, we would have one precision and then discover that, okay, enough are not providing us with that. We have to pull back. So that was interesting. Um, Sometimes we have to talk to the actual astronaut, which we had to do recently. Yeah. Um, we have, we're friendly with a few astronauts that we work with for our reporting. One in particular, astronaut Nicole Stott, um, who we love very much. Um, her, one of her biographies on NASA's website had like six hours. Like it was rounding her spacewalk time or something. Mm. And then other releases had a different time. So we, you know, even in that instance, we, tr we want to be as accurate as possible. Obviously, 10 minutes isn't, you know, I mean, yeah. some but 10 when, minutes in space isn't an eternity. But when you look <laughs> so, at this you know. um, as a comparison engine, um, right. where we want to rank things and compare them, it actually has an, a, a, a meaning to our users. But Robin, I interrupted you. Yeah, no. And yeah. just going up to yesterday, um, Mike and Victor um, on the space station, uh, I think I believe it was uh, their first spacewalks, or at least Victor's, and we had to work on uh, that time and our our um, launch tracker and ADB uh, contributor Chris had to actually go back to the videos and you know sometimes the live stream time doesn't match up with what's really happening. That happens all the time. Yeah, so we USA do have and to, Russia doesn't right. agree sometimes on what time someone came back into a spaceship. Right. So you kind of have to go a little forensic on it and really analyze videos um, not to get off topic, but we did an article about the moon rock that it now sits in the oval office. Now, Jamie and I had to go back to Apollo 17 in real time, look at the live footage, look at oh, yeah. all the and photographs the documents of all the right. labeled rocks to figure right. out which video clip was mm -hmm. the, time when they were in the right valley when right. they would have been maybe picking up the rock all to determine that no there's actually not great film footage of them right the <laughs> and, but there's a nice photo <laughs> right so you know it, a lot it's very fun to do sometimes because you're you know, digging great, through yeah. history um but this is why um creating these centralized databases have been so hard in the past they require a long long uh dive into uh past research 
yeah, and the last two that, that I'll, uh, you know, we can talk about these together because they're related is spelling weirdness and translation issues, uh, in particular transliteration issues, because not all people of Earth use the same alphabet. Right. So we run into issues where since we want to put this all in, uh, you know, an English based website with, you know, building accessibility as we go, but essentially the, the base data is using the English alphabet. Um, and so we have to choose, are we going to use, if, if the name is Sergey, is it going to be G-E-I or G-E-Y? And then once you make that decision, you have to make sure that all the other data sets that you're trying to bring together into one large data set is using that same spelling, because otherwise you're going to duplicates. And for a while I was trying to figure out, is this Alexander number one or two or three? And you also run into the um, common names in other languages, you know, in the same way we might have a lot of Smiths uh, in one part of the world, you're going to have, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Sergeys in another part of the world. Oh, uh, there's Alexander's, a lot of Sergeys. Yeah, yeah Alexanders Sergeys. And, and, and variations on names. Um, and then also just spelling weirdness with accents um, on letters, things like that. Um, even with uh, Suichi, who was on the um, flight the other day, we ran into that. So, but again, as Robin said, this has all really been fun and has just been this endless um, track of forced learning, step by step. It's like, well, now you have to know about this amazing story. Now you have to know about this other one. So now I think finally we should dive into what came from all of that research and all of those spreadsheets and how we decided to actually present this thing. Yeah, and one more thing before we get into this. Oh. Uh, there was one point that we learned uh, after launch was that some folks did not want to be representatives of a certain country. Like if, you know, because we can only go by where they were born and where they hold citizenship. But over the years, some of those astronauts have moved. They've repatriated in other countries. Um, some of them changed their names. One really surprising thing that happened, though, was that we found out that a few of our astronauts' birthdays were incorrect because nobody knew their actual birthday. And they not were that and to be specific, not like, yeah. oh, nobody wrote it down. Like no. their family didn't write it down because right. culturally they don't. Right. So they only just write everyone have the same birthday in a certain culture. Right. Yeah. So some cultures and some nations, um, they didn't have official paperwork or it just wasn't recorded what day or what time uh, these folks were born. Yeah, wasn't so, considered important to them. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. So there was adjustments made there. And like I said, um, representation for nation, things like that. Some of those things were adjusted, but it wasn't more than like a handful, I think, on, on those certain points. But it's but yeah. important to us to adhere to whatever human story people want to tell for themselves. And that, mm -hmm. again, is an interesting thing about this is it's not just data. It's a story of humanity and it carries inside it those decisions, much like we had mentioned that we include uh, the Apollo 1 astronauts and the mm -hmm. Challenger tragedy astronauts in there because that's the human thing to do, um, not the strictly data-based thing to do. Um, so this is uh, the main page that you see when you land on the astronaut database, uh, showing one of our favorite views, which we um, lovingly called the baseball card view, um, the astronaut cards, which is essentially, uh, you know, the key photo, their portrait, and then what we decided are the key key stats for an astronaut. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that you can tell about the achievements of one astronaut, but we wanted to come up with a system so that you could quickly get a sense of how experienced they were, of how uh, many missions they've been on. And those four factors were the uh, number of missions, the days in space, the number of spacewalks, and the number of days spent spacewalking, often fractional, but sometimes multiple days for the real veterans. You'll also see along the bottom, uh, some of them have these little icons, um, you know, one that looks like the ISS and then 100 kilometers and then a little house. We started to assign badges so that it's another way to quickly get a sense. Um, in the live site, we can, you know, I hope that you'll all go and try it out, but we'll also do a live demo in a moment. When you hover over them, it describes what they are. The first one there being um, an image of the ISS because that's someone who visited the ISS. And so this is a really quick way to navigate through that. Um, you can also, in the upper right corner, we have the in space toggle, which uh, if you flip that on, you get to see only the people who are actively in space. So this screenshot is from um, not prior, prior to crew one. Yeah, prior yeah. to crew one launch. Yep. 
Um, and so that's a really fun thing about it. And then the other thing that was really important to us, um, you notice that we mentioned humans, animals, and robots, was to include other types of life forms, because that's a, such a fun and interesting and vital part of this story. So for example, if you were to choose dog, you know, we have a, we had to group the life forms into useful categories for the menu. So in the dogs, cats, and bats category, you get all kinds of interesting um, interesting popos that went to space, many of them from the Soviet Union. Um, I always like to mention here that there was only one cat ever sent to space. The French decided we will train a cat and they did it and then no one else tried it again because yeah. it people was like- think, yeah. People yeah. think going to the moon was the hardest thing we've done in space exploration. No, it was training this one cat yeah. and there's a reason we uh, never did it again. <laughs> Yes. Um, the other thing that, uh, as we mentioned, that was really important to us is to be able to move through the data, not to just present a list for people, not just a static spreadsheet, but to be able to move through it. And that's where um, this type of thing comes in, is that if you have, um, you know, let's say you start on Tamara Jernigan, you can see the missions that she was on, but also you can see her crewmates. We list the launch crew. And so you can see the connection of who flew with who and continue to move through that data. There's no particular endpoint. You look at one of those astronauts and then you see their missions. Um, you also see the craft. If you look on, oh, sorry, it says crafts on this slide. Yeah, we changed it. <laughs> yeah, that's the paper mache space shuttle. Um, mm -hmm. But anyhow, the, um, you can see what they flew on, who they flew with, and also the animals that may have flown on that mission with them. So, uh, Robin, I think we'll switch to a live demo here. Yeah, let's let's do it. Yeah, because yeah, we definitely edit some all, stuff. Yeah, and can you all take some questions? We have yeah, some yeah, questions. please. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Um, so, Carrie was wondering what what kind of support do you have from NASA and the other space agencies? Um, I'll answer this one. We are currently um, talking to NASA now. Um, the problem with changing administrations, we didn't want to start a new project with NASA when there was gonna be a huge change in leadership. This happens every few years. Um, but we are gonna engage with NASA and the NASA History Office um, in, in the coming year to get more accurate information. Um, the European Space Agency was kind enough to share the astronaut database on their channels. Uh, we were really happy with that. But yes, I think going forward, we are gonna be engaging with uh, the space, uh, the official space agencies. When it comes to the private companies, we work directly with all of them. Yeah, essentially we conducted the research as like a first pass on our own. And then once we had it in a sort of congealed form, we started bouncing it against both the community and the experts to see where there were holes in it. And at this point, um, you know, Robin, you, you can tell me what you think. I feel pretty confident that this is the best list. And we've had a few um, moments to make comparisons um, and it's held up. In fact, the, the Center for Strategic and International Studies released their own list of astronauts and we found several errors right away that we cross-checked. Not to call them out. No, I, I like to <laughs> call them out because I feel like they're this big fancy organization and we're like this scrappy media company trying to get it done. Um, I, you know, I'm sure that they are making corrections and it was, yeah. it was like the second day of their launch where we had corrections too, but... Yeah. Um, at this point, it feels it feels pretty robust to me. I want to note that the biggest contributor, biggest help, biggest fact checker on the ADB was the space community uh, itself, the space fans, uh, people around the world um, who uh, love space exploration. They sent us ideas. They sent us corrections, better facts. Uh, you know, it was some fans who corrected some of the astronauts' nationality. They linked us to uh, well-sourced work to help improve uh, the astronaut database. Nice. One, um, one astronaut uh, or dogmonaut, as the Soviet Union called their dog astronauts, that I always like to point out is this dog. It was original call, originally named um, Kusha, uh, Kusachka, which, uh, forgive me, I don't speak Russian. I can't tell you what Kusachka means, but um, as it continued to fly on repeated missions, they realized that this dog needed a fancier name. And so they changed its name to Adveznaya, which means brave one or intrepid one in Russian. And its record of seven missions is still unbeat by any human or animal. There are people who have flown on seven missions, but no person is a more experienced astronaut than Adveznaya the dog. Wow. Um, and these and, are the types of things that we discovered through doing this project. And, uh, and clearly has a rabbit friend. 
Yes. Oh, yes. That is Marfusa the rabbit, who's yeah. the, only, the only space rabbit. The only space <laughs> rabbit. Yeah. Um, one thing can, I wanted... No, go ahead, please. I was wondering, can you can you look up the Minotaur 5 frog? Because Patrick's asking, how did you find the uh, photo for it? And it's okay. hilarious. Um, so yeah. the Minotaur frog, um, that was a someone who emailed us and said, can you guys please, please include the Minotaur frog? And I think Jamie already had it on his list or something to add in there. But yeah. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. yeah this is another oh, one of those, those yeah. sort of like spiritual things that we have to include. Um, where, the fun stuff. The fun yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, this is just a frog that was tossed off by a Minotaur 5 launch. Um, we got the photo know. from NASA. Yes, yeah, this is a crop, obviously, you can see all the way on the right there, one of the boosters on the edge. Um, mm-hmm. This is me punching in and enhancing and sharpening to really pull out the frog. Um, <laughs> it's a frog of unknown species, we can make speculations based on the location of the launch. Um, but of course, we like the like to anthropomorphize anything we see. So I'm just going to imagine that he had hopes and dreams and was trying to pull a, a little frog heist and break his way under the rocket and get to space and it went wrong. But for a moment, he lived his dream um, before. Jimmy, do we have the bat? From we shuttle? do have the bat. Yeah, yeah we have the bat from shuttle. Here. <laughs> Another one of these, um, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, Unknown free-tailed bat. Yes, this one we do know that it is a, a free-tailed bat, but because there were multiple free-tailed bat species, I couldn't get super specific on mm-hmm. um, on it. But yeah, this was a bat that clung to the side of the space shuttle. You can see this orange color is that large fuel tank that everyone's familiar with. Um, and made it at least uh, past liftoff, maybe, but was likely cast off by vibrations right Aww. away. But we all like to imagine that, you know, he made it until the and air. See, got- if, you know, starting off at fun stuff like this, we can click through the mission, see who was actually on it, see yes. what stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's. And that's the mission. We, we tried to include, this was hard research to find the mission ba- uh, badges and patches designs for each mission um, was not easy. And I oh, think we're still, stuff, yeah. yeah, we're still filling out that a lot of those images too, because a lot of them don't exist anywhere online. Yes, yeah, some of these, it's interesting. There's a whole, I mean, there's a, there's a, a nice book to be written just about the cultural history of, of mission patches, because you see again, the different approaches that different groups took. In the US, there was this thought that every single mission will have a completely new patch. And then sometimes there would be series where they use the same base design and change the foreground design. And then in the Soviet Union, they would do entire programs with almost the identical patch and just change some numbers or names. And so we had to suss out which of these was considered official also. Sometimes people would make a patch and just share it amongst their astronaut friends, but it would not be the official one, um, you know, for NASA. And all these kinds of things of, again, trying to squeeze imperfect data into a system that wants it all to be exactly filled out. And then we have to make these assumptions. But again, we can scroll down and see um, who was on that mission and then start to uh, learn about them as well. Something I wanted to point out to everybody um, is the list view, which we have this wonderful card view, but if you switch over to the list view on the upper left, this is where you can start ranking and comparing and really starting to see some interesting things about the data. Like, let's see who has the most spacewalks in history. You see that's Anatoly Solovyev. Um, And this was something interesting that I didn't know. He's the leader by a really significant amount. You can see the number of spacewalks there. I think he's he's ahead by six to his nearest uh, um, editor. Just uh, Jamie, I was watching the movie Gravity the other day, and yeah. uh, that's a subplot with George Clooney's character. I oh, believe. that he's going to break the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah they mentioned Anatoly Solovyev's record. Right. Um, which, speaking of space movies and, and history, we recently made a documentary about the ISS 20th um, anniversary, and we looked at a bunch of old sci-fi films. This is unrelated, but just it made me think of it. We looked at a bunch of old sci-fi films, some of which were directed, it turns out, by an Italian named um, Antonio Margarete. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that that's the name, the fake name that Tarantino gave to one of the guys at the end of Inglorious Bastards when they go into the theater. He says, I am Antonio Margarete. <laughs> I, never, I never knew that that name meant anything. But again, through researching space, I learned, oh, it's a famous space sci-fi director who, who made a big splash. <laughs> Yeah, he was a pulp director. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Robin, I guess we should go through some interesting um, other astronauts. Now. Yeah. Um, let's let's go to Victor Glover because he was the first astronaut added since creating the astronaut database. Um, so, yesterday morning, 
um, his time and space was obviously 72 days instead of, or 73 days. Yeah, you can see, hours. by the way, that it continues counting because he's right. in space right He's now. at the space station right now. But yeah. yesterday morning, um, his spacewalk time was zero hours, zero, zero minutes. And as soon as he re-entered the ISS after his spacewalk, we updated it uh, to reflect that. Um, and yeah, this is Victor Glover's first time uh, to space. He is the first African-American uh, man to live and work aboard the space station. Um, so yeah, we're, we were really excited to add him and we're, you know, we're a adding to his uh, profile uh, as he spends time in space. And the, obviously the time in space, that's automated. Um, but the space walk time is something we add because like Jamie and I said, it's sort of forensic how you uh, measure it and watch the video and clock NASA's time and clock other agencies tracking it. Yeah, yeah, the beginning and ending of a spacewalk is supposed to be, you know, leaving the door and entering the door. Mm -hmm. um, but it can depend on who's writing down the time or how far away they were, or who called. That can make a difference of seconds or minutes. Right. And then two news stations report it. And then it goes into two documents and then it, you know, the, the truth um, gets a little lost. In it, it gets watered down <laughs> and, and we've seen that. Um, yeah. And, and um, while we're here, let's, oh, go, let's go to Baby Yoda. Um, so this in the middle of the really night. This was a really fun development. Yeah. So after launch, um, I think it was 24 hours later, um, we, we were monitoring the live stream of Dragon going toward the space station with its crew. And in the middle of the night, I just happened to be awake and I like to screen grab stuff that's going on to share on social media. And it was right when Baby Yoda was introduced on the mission. So we screen grabbed it and we published it on our social media. Um, it was one of our viral tweets during the mission. But then we started getting messages. Hey, are you guys going to add Baby? We didn't know Grogu's name at the time. But, and spoiler, if anyone hasn't seen yeah. The Mandalorian yet. Also, but, it, it doesn't mean anything in the plot of the it doesn't show, mean by anything, the way. Yeah. It doesn't mean, yeah, um, it doesn't change anything. But, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, people were like, when are you guys going to add Baby Yoda to the astronaut database? And I was like, I don't know if we're going to do that. You know, I, we, we have a really uh, very human voice on our social media channels. So we tweeted in the middle of the night, sorry, guys, um, we're not going to be adding Ash, um, Baby Yoda to the astronaut database. And all of the space reporters who are colleagues of ours and friends of ours um, started tweeting that we should. And there was in the morning, we had um, hundreds of tweets at us to add uh, Baby Yoda to the astronaut database. And some made the argument that we had a mannequin and robot section mm -hmm. and that Baby Yoda could live there for now until we create. Um, Jamie and I are trying to figure out how to do this, but we're thinking we might create uh, a zero G indicator category to include like, um, stuff like Baby Yoda and, and stuff that people love. But after a bunch of tweets and almost everyone in the space community calling for us to do so, the final nail in the coffin was Elon Musk getting in the conversation and also calling for us to do so. So we, we Jamie uh, prepped it, got it ready, and um, we published it. And then we changed the name a couple weeks ago uh -huh. when we thought that everyone had seen uh, The Mandalorian at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we had a question um, from Tina asking, what is in the background of the Baby Yoda pic? Oh, that's, uh, I believe that's Dragon. Um, oh, the, oh, the, the. Yeah, that's Crew the... Dragon. Um, SpaceX's uh, Dragon 2 capsule, which uh, shuttles uh, astronauts to the space station for NASA. Yeah, you can, if you, um, if you Google uh, Baby Yoda SpaceX, you'll see the video clip. This is actually a still from video. Mm -hmm. You can see it's sort of been enhanced. Uh, but in the background there, you see a, 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 a person sitting in a chair and Baby Yoda is actually floating just in front of another chair. Yeah. Um, and they kind of sit side by side in two rows um, in the capsule. It's from what I understand, great. a little background, I believe that Jon Favreau and Elon Musk are really good friends. If you've seen Iron Man 1 or 2, they shot some of those films at SpaceX headquarters. And, and Elon, Elon Musk makes a cameo. Cameo in, in Iron Man 2. So that's their, the connection there. Also, drag, um, Falcon 9 is named after the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Nice. And um, you can see on our robots and mannequins page, this is kind of another place where we had to make some decisions about what counts as a life form mm -hmm. in particular um, in the robots uh, area, because there's a lot of satellites and, you know, probes and things that have certain robotic characteristics. Uh, but we had to come up with 
Um, oh, we're having a little render problem for Dexter. Look at that name. We'll have to fix that. Uh -oh. Yeah. Anyhow, we had to come up with some way to uh, draw the line. You know, it's a human story. So humans make the decision, but where do we draw the line? And what we came up with is it counts as a robot. If it was in a space, if it, it started outside a spaceship, it went into a spaceship, flew to space, and then got out of the spaceship and moved around. Can't just go into orbit, it has to move around and do stuff. And I know that's vague and imprecise, but that's how we arrived here. So we have robotic spacecraft, um, landers, rovers, robots, and, and mannequins in here. Um, and we encourage that. people, if there's something missing from the ADB that you feel strongly should be in there, feel free to message us. Oh, please, um, absolutely. Because I think yeah. eventually this, this database could eventually have have everything that's been launched to space. Yeah, the, the big goal, as we mentioned in the beginning, is to have that real 360 view. We throw around this term, the database of all things space, is like what we really want to have. And um, it's, it's sort of like what Robin was saying, at some point, these will all be data points. It's just a question of where do they go? Right. Is the astronaut database the right place to put that? Or is a future, you know, all orbiting objects database a, a place where that goes? Do we have any more questions? Yeah, we had a question from Carrie asking, um, are you updating these by hand or do you have any volunteers or interns that help you out? Oh, no, this is, uh, you know, every, everyone at Supercluster does everything. Um, so, um, who, you know, Jamie does a lot of the coding uh, or uh, updating the, uh, the ADB itself. So, yeah, we go through a process of, all right, let's look at what this is. Um, we do a copy uh writing copy, checking copy, fact checking process. We do a design process and then we send all that to Jamie or Chris and they upload it uh, to our utility. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, we, we operate on that model of having like a core team of experts who wear a lot of hats. And then we have a large team of contributors and collaborators mm -hmm. that we call on for various tasks. And um, simply from the fact that I was one of the first to dive into the data for this project, makes me a little f more familiar with it and able to catch some of those errors. But I rely on the entire rest of the team as well. Like uh, by no means is it, as Robin was saying, is it like one source that it funnels through. Um, and it's also useful to have, you know, if I'm busy, Chris can update it, or if Chris is busy, Robin can update it, or, mm -hmm. you know, whoever has access to it. Um, but mostly it's organic. And a lot of the corrections at this point come from the community. We get a message in, we, we talk as a team, okay, is this a valid thing? Does this make sense? And then it goes in there relatively quickly. So it's, it's a real live dialogue, and we're not um, protective about it. You know, it's not like right. there's some long review process and how dare you suggest it's no, no, please. This is meant to be community supported. Um, and, uh, and that's how we, we approach it. Right. And, uh, the design at Supercluster, just to speak to that, um, we have, uh, Grand Army as one of the founders of Supercluster. They're a New York city based design agency, and they're probably one of the top shops in the world. We're very lucky to be, uh, working with them. They lead our design. They lead our, our interface design. And, um, that's why everything looks so sleek and, um, wait, these baseball cards, people love them. Um, a lot of work went into visualizing this. Um, and a lot of those, uh, Grand Army folks, um, are responsible for that. And all these wonderful spacecraft drawings. Yes, we way. love those little yeah. tiny drawings. Shout out um, to Tristan. Yeah, uh, Tristan, uh, one of the folks who does a lot of the uh, creative art uh, work for these projects, um, has such a great eye for space exploration, the design. I always say that if Tristan wasn't working here, he'd probably working at a space company doing rockets or something. <laughs> yeah, totally. Definitely. Um, and we had a, a, a lot of other comments as yeah, well. Um, uh, Leo was just saying that they scrolled through it the other day and love seeing all of the astronauts and how many days in space they have. Uh, Tina says, this is so super cool in all caps. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we had, we had a couple questions, but I think, I think the, they, they figured out how to uh, sort, sort by the certain things. In okay. Yeah. The yeah. I was just seeing that question. Yeah. If you click on, on life forms, one thing to note about the interface is anything that's grayed out can be selected. It's just grayed out to show what is and is not selected. So if you click on life forms and humans is selected, just click on any of the other ones and those lists will come up. Wonderful. And Carrie just asked, how are you funded? 
We have uh, um, our, our founders were A24 Films and Grand Army. Uh, A24 Films is a, a movie studio, television movie studio. They have an Oscar for Moonlight um, and they made some incredible movies. I think this fan base here, we all know Ex Machina and uh, films like that. That's A24. Um, and then we have uh, one of our sponsors is Dropbox, which I'm sure a lot of folks use Dropbox. They've been a really great uh, partner and leader in getting Supercluster stuff out there. If you guys have noticed, um, we do not have any ads on our website. There's not a single ad on any of our articles. And we're trying to keep this experience um, free of that. Um, and it, that's possible because of Dropbox and our other partners. Yeah, essentially, we we work on, um, you know, I guess you could call it sort of like a branded content model, but essentially, we find people who either want uh, to directly tell a story, um, you know, in some cases, there's a space story, and they just approach us, hey, you're good, please, we'll hire you. And that's kind of a traditional mm -hmm. documentary film relationship, or whether it's going to be. But a lot of times, uh, people just, you know, a brand will want to just support our efforts, and they don't have any real input into what stories we're telling or how we tell them. We just pick to them, hey, here's what we want to develop. If you want to support it, uh, we will associate you with it. And it's really been a, a nice way to, to do business. We have complete editorial freedom too. Yeah. Complete end yeah. to end. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And there's even been, you know, there's cases where we'll make something and uh, we have a sponsor who says, no, we don't want to be attached to that. So we publish it without them and work with them on something else. And it mm -hmm. all kind of, it all kind of works out. So and we've diverted some yeah. of our funds to other projects too. Um, uh, the uh, spiral graph project being one of them, um, a citizen science project. We've, you know, we try to use our, our resources to help build up other space projects and space programs. And, um, and we're going to be making announcements soon about a new sector of the company that we're starting to work directly with the space industry on marketing and, and design. And people really love the astronaut database. I can see us doing another utility in the future directly with the space industry, something that they might pay for or something like that. Yeah, we would love to become a significant part of the storytelling arm of all space endeavors. Right. So the, yeah, the, the, the stories that people can't tell or don't have the ability to tell or the right. time to tell or, you know, at anything like that, we want to um, bring all of the world of TV and film and advertising and art and design and music and all the skills from that world and apply them to the greatest stories we've ever heard. I should also say real quick, this is astronomy days. Uh, we talked a lot about space flight. We also <laughs> dearly, dearly love astronomy. Also, if you go to super, dare, yeah. how dare we explain a black hole? That was so terrifying to play that video that explains a black I hole. I know, we're, so, we're sorry. Astronomers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, if you go to supercluster.com, um, we, we work with a photographer named Eric Kuna. And we also work with John Krauss, who you guys know, but he does many on launch photography. But we do a lot of astrophotography. And it's on our website. We do a lot of articles about astronomy. Um, and, you know, a lot of SETI work. We love covering SETI work. So we're, we hope we didn't give you the wrong idea. We, our website <laughs> and our, our project and, our, and a lot of stuff we do does circle around astronomy and our love for astronomy. Well, I, mean, I feel like that's like the basis of the yeah. like creating Look, we this. Don't, <laughs> yeah. our work, we, we mash everything together because, you know, our community is one community and, you know, you can easily talk about astronomy and space flight in the same sentence. So yeah, oftentimes and I mean, <laughs> we forget to separate. And without astronomy, um, I guess astronauts would just be exploring an empty <laughs> yeah. void. Just with no nothing. Object, right. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. love astronomy. Um, and we will be, I think... I, we will, I'm not putting ourselves on the spot here, but I do see us doing apps and utilities just like the astronaut database for astronomy. So if anyone yes. out there has <laughs> suggestions, ideas, something that you need um, in, to do astronomy work, tell us what they are because we'll build it. Yeah, we do have something specifically in the pipeline that I'll that I'll keep close to the chest for now. But yes, we, we have our eyes maybe, on the stars Maybe next at all year, times. astronomy <laughs> yeah. days, we'll have something for you all. Um, to talk about, but we, we do want to make an astronomy uh, app and there's a lot of great ones out there, the, you know, the Skywatcher apps and everything. What is the next thing? What, what does your community need? What, you know, what do professionals need? Um, that's what we need to know in order for us to build it. That's great. And Nancy, you said it's like an all, well, the, the astronaut database is like an all inclusive virtual astronomy library slash museum. So oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, <Yes. laughs> you know, yeah. it's just version one. 
um, over the course of, you know, the next year or two, you're going to see it built out with new information, um, new features. You know, we're always going to improve on our software going forward. Those who have had our launch tracker since day one know how much we've changed it, how much we've improved it. And yeah. um, that will always become, be happening. It becomes also what ability we have to wrangle data. Um, yeah. In the case of the astronaut database right now, there's about a thousand entries between the human astronauts, the robots, and the animals. If we were to move in to saying, okay, let's include all orbital flights in history, that becomes about 6,000 entries that we it's then a have lot. to wrangle. Yeah. And then if wow. we want to say, let's include all rocket launches that actually made it to space, maybe not orbit, but just you know up and down like a sound rocket becomes about 40 to 50,000 entries to give you an idea of how the data just gets bigger and bigger. So we have these things in our roadmap, but it becomes a bigger task. Like it's not necessarily something that one person can sit down and do anymore. So we have right. to maybe find funding to get there, but it's, it's all, it's all a goal. To it's like, it's, everything. yeah, it, it's our, that's our huge goal is just the one place for everything. And we know we're not there yet. We got a plenty of building to do, but I think right now the ADB, um, is something that just didn't exist before. And it, you know who, who we get messages from space flight reporters once in a while, like, thank you. <laughs> I don't have to six tab. Yeah. If anything, yeah. we've decreased tab usage. That's true. Right. Yeah. In the world. You can, you can get you know, all in answer. one place. <laughs> yeah. No more, no more seven tabs to write, um, to write an question. 800 word article. One question I want to just answer real quick from, not a question, but a point somebody made in the chat here is they said, uh, please show some love for Dr. Jessica Watkins, NASA Group 22, slated for Artemis, but not yet in your database. Now, this is something else we had to face mm -hmm. is with these training astronauts, which is only going to get bigger and bigger. But the, the way that we decided, and this came up with Mr. Glover, actually, mm -hmm. was once you have a mission that's slated and you're on it and we need to add that mission to our launch tracker, well, we got to have the crew on that mission. You go right. in the astronaut database. So the only pre-flight astronauts who make it in are ones who have the scheduled flight, just because, again, we had to draw right. the line somewhere. So um, this is a, and I, I think that we are going to start being more ceremonial about adding astronauts to the database. And it's mm. going to be a bigger deal. I want to um, send them their astronaut number. Yeah, we're going to send them. We want to do all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. But um, I, do, I do understand that question. And I do see in the future some kind of module or something that maybe sets them up to be added or something like yeah, that. But the on, the on deck circle, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. But I want you guys to know that we are working directly with the private space flight companies. I'm not going to drop them, their names, but you guys know who they are, you know. And <laughs> they, uh, we're working directly with them to get this system set up, to get the accurate information, the correct photo of their astronaut, the information they want to share, and, and make sure it's all ready to go as soon as they cross the Carmen line. Yeah, yeah, because we don't we don't want to be chasing after right. it. It needs no. to just be like we flip a switch. And, that, and these astronaut, uh, the, these uh, private spaceflight companies, they came to us immediately the day after we went live with the astronaut database. They they were like, hey, we want to work with you on this because they saw value in it. Um, and I think once we get that ball rolling, once humans are launching privately more often, we'll start doing the same with NASA. Um, there's a lot of people queued up to fly on Artemis and fly on crew missions. Um, so we will have to create a channel between us and NASA to make sure that information is preloaded. We'll do the same with ESA, ISRO in the future. And whoever else is launching humans to space, we have to work. Well, we're, we're optimistic about the fact that the pace may go up. You know? Yeah. Right now, it's like, yeah, every few months, we might have to add a few people in. Mm -hmm. But um, eventually, we might have the lovely problem of that being several per week, several per day. Who knows? So we have to be ready to have a bigger stream of uh, things. <clears> and that happened to the launch tracker. When we started the launch visualizing and conceptualizing it three years ago, um, there wasn't many, as many launches as there are now. And that obviously credit to SpaceX for launching 20 missions, 25 missions in a year. But the, that has grown dramatically um, in the last two, three years alone. So we already, you know, I think we're mentally prepared for he, the human aspect to increase as well. Right, great. Um, we have a couple more questions and not much time to cover them. All right, so. we'll, try, we'll try to keep our, yeah. uh, our answers <laughs> okay. briefer than 
What no worries. <laughs> no worries. Um, Tina was asking what was said about satellites. Was that just that, yes. like, all the data wrangling that would, it would take? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's part of the data wrangling thing. We, um, one thing we've been, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things we've been trying to crack in terms of representing data. But one thing that would, would really be a big part of the story for our audience is just tracking the satellites currently in orbit. Uh, but once again, that becomes um, a big kind of wrangling thing. But there's not an, yeah, yeah. There's, there's not an organization in this world, not even NASA, um, that could do that correctly the first time. It's, it's going to be. And then we have look. to decide on like the size of the objects and culling oh, all yeah. the, you know, because you can go like Raytheon has a giant control room to try and do this. So yeah. um, 100% the roadmap, but we're going to have to tell the satellite story by choosing a small group of satellites first. Right. Um, Nancy asks, do you have an internship program? Not uh, yet, but we're looking into it. Um, if you're interested yeah. in working with Supercluster, we always. Say hit us up. Um, con um, I think it's info at supercluster.com is our email. Um, send us a DM on Twitter or Instagram. If there's a way that you know you want to pitch us a story or a photo essay or something, and I you know reach out to us somehow. But we don't have any official internship programs right now. But we're looking into it for the future. We are working with freelancers and contributors though. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Great. And Patrick was asking, could the launch tracker have a launch visibility option based on GPS? Yes. Yes. Yes, it should. It um, should have that. You know, we essentially, um, there, there was a lot of attention paid to the, like, view the launch section in our launch tracker. Um, the current uh, pandemic situation sort of took some attention off of that. But that's 100% something we want to do. There's a really great, um, Robin, what's the name of that service that tells you the arc of every launch? It escapes me right now. Flight Club. Flight Club. So we, yeah. um, you know, friends of ours, uh, you know, work, use this tool all the time that tells you in advance exactly the arc of a launch. It helps you if you're going to photograph it because mm. you can see where it's going to go relative to the rise and all that. Essentially, we want to get that exact kind of math into the launch tracker so that you can drop a pin and it can judge, you know, distance right. to the horizon, how much over the horizon and all that. But um, mm. so the answer is yes, great idea, but um, we don't have it. <laughs> we don't have it yet. Yeah. And, it, you know, we, we need to get beyond the pandemic before we start doing more location-based, uh, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, 2020 we, was meant to be very in-person launches, and it ended yeah. up being very not that. The opposite of that. The yeah. whole, you know, one of the big things with Supercluster was creating fanfare and, and you know, yeah, tailgate-type situation at yeah. rocket launches. And we were doing really well at that. We had some amazing events, and then, boom, we had to switch back to digital and, you know, like we all are, we're all home doing computer stuff. So soon enough, we'll be back in the field and uh, doing some crazy stuff out at Cape Canaveral in California. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. So I have to start wrapping it up now. But thank you both so much for coming and talking with us today. Thanks I for having us. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I am showing my last little slide here. Um, Thank you so much to our sponsor for the North Carolina Space Grant um, and our members of the museum who help make events like Astronomy Days happen. Um, members save 10% and get exclusive access to members only events, discounts, and more. So if you would like to save 10% on these uh, t-shirts and hoodies that you see in this picture, um, please feel free to join our membership. The link is at the bottom. It's naturalsciences.org slash membership. And there are other great programs scheduled for this week. Um, I think Skelly posted the link in chat, but we can post it again for how to register for those other programs. And we would like to hear your feedback on our programming um, to help us improve. So we have a survey link that we'll um, email to you if you registered for this program, but we can also post it in chat. And finally, the recording of this program will be posted on the Astronomy Days program page um, in a few days. And uh, thank you so much for attending. And again, thank you to Jamie and Robin. Thanks, and everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Keep bye looking bye. up. Yep. Yes, always. always. <laughs> <laughs>